good afternoon. And thank you all. Thank you very much, Nigel, for asking me to talk about this interesting subject, which is identity, because it's very well interwoven into what we do. So I will start with a bit about our work. Before I go there, I'm going to talk about the subject of culture, memory, and place, because we always talk about our work as being rooted in culture, memory, and place. And as Nigel mentioned, we're a Singapore-based firm, WOW Architects, and Warner Wong Design. Identity, to me, my own definition simply stated, is when something is rooted in something, it has an identity. It has to have roots. And when we see these images that are projected in the media, they get a lot of attention, but we don't really see the whole story. They don't really tell you about their location. They don't tell you about the context. They don't elaborate on the users or the purpose or the time in history when they were developed. You know, I'd even go so far to say is that they're very comforting images. We all sort of follow these Instagram sites. We enjoy looking at them. They're soothing because they're graphically balanced and well composed, and they're somewhat provocative. Yet, we look at them to find inspiration, and they're in good company because there's a strong suggestion that what is depicted in them is good, and you'll notice that every so often they insert a beautiful woman or somebody you're longing to see, and it's quite ironic that there are always these surprise elements which keep us hooked to them. But there's a consistency in there of what I call good design. But I wonder if repeated exposure to these icons of good design and good taste and good photography are cultivating a lexicon of similar forms and a culture of sameness. Although each of them are unique in their context and they are complex experientially, the experience and the context don't come into the images. They're just good design, and that can be discerned at a glance at 24 images simultaneously. Almost instantly, we can say that well, they're all pretty good images. But mass dissemination of these kind of images seems to reinforce a consensus about what constitutes good good design, and it's often divorced from its culture, its inhabitants, their collective experience, and its location, all of which give each of the projects their unique identity. And when it comes to digital design and parametric design in the future, when we see machine learning influencing and artificial intelligence influencing design, we'd expect even more exportability and less connection to the people, places, and particularities of each project. Although they may look less similar, they may look more diverse, but they may be actually less rooted in their place. So we ask this question, are we cultivating a culture of sameness, of instant visual gratification? Now, some of us live in places like these, not I, but you know, they're not the simplistic compositional moments that ge these geometries suggest. Okay? Consider for a moment the food, if it appeared to be as consistent. Would you be able to say if these dishes would be better than another? Does the restaurant, the setting, the surroundings, the service, or the weather affect how this food will taste to you? Do these images make your mouth water? What about this food? Are you equally able to assess whether the food is good? Is your mouth watering now? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Does it matter that the image on the right is street food, whereas the food on the left is all Michelin-starred cuisine? Is there a difference in how they provoke a memory for you, a desire or a craving? Would you say that one group has a stronger identity and a sense of connection or rootedness than the other? Now I'm just going to pair the interiors with the food to provoke you. Do you feel the images here shown have a strong identity? Or is it the same with this set of messy and different and inconsistent images, pairing the interior design with the food? Does it evoke a different sense? So when we compare the interior design of the two palettes, the monochrome and the diverse, how, does, how do you respond? So I want to talk a bit about identity, but I need to go back a slide, just one second if I can. Make sure I can do that. Okay. Uh -huh. Oh. Sorry, one second. OK. 
Okay, I'm going to get it fixed right now. There it is. Okay. This is an image of a table. It was the first piece of furniture I ever designed, and I designed it in 1986 in Los Angeles when I moved into an apartment as a student, and I wasn't going to live there long enough to justify buying a table, and I couldn't afford to buy a table. So I needed to do something, and I needed to do it very simply. So this table actually kind of expresses a lot of what is important to me. It's got that simplicity. It's got just something that was made for its purpose, one leg, because that's all we could afford. But I think at that time, these images also show that images have always influenced us as architects, but we were a little bit more invested in the images at that time. We looked at them, we studied them from many angles. When we looked at something, we really wanted to understand it and not just consume it. Um, now, this is who we are today. Our firm in Singapore, there are 50 of us in Singapore. It's a very diverse team of quite young people, and it's a very exciting and you know, fascinating place to work. It sits at the crossroads sort of of everything in Asia. Um, this map I like to show, although my partner Chuman doesn't love it, because it's a very limited map. It's a map of a part of the world, and it's the part of the world that I feel we know. And we've gotten to know it by doing work in all the places where you see the little red dots over the years. And it's not that we're experts, you know, location experts in all these places. It's that we have experienced these places, we have gotten to know people there, we have worked with people in each of those places, and we feel invested in this part of the world. Global is a word I'm not comfortable with. I never have been. I don't feel that there really is anything that can be truly and completely global. So, although this is a very big region, an actual fact, it is the region that I, for one, am quite comfortable with. And, and these are all the countries, of course, where we've done or we're doing work now. And that's a lot of different cultures, a lot of places, and a lot of different people. So as I get into the topic of culture, memory, and place, I just want to highlight that for us, it's not about learning the culture and the language of each of the places that we visit and travel to. It's not that Indians behave like Indians and Chinese behave like Chinese. It's more that every client has their own unique cultural habits, their own culture within their family or their organization, or every hotel operator has a different culture, and that's what we try to connect with. And this is my most recent project, which is our office in Singapore, in renders, because we haven't photographed it yet. But it's this space where we work together with our team to have more collective activities with more people in more places. So it's been set up for that. So now I'm going to talk more about sensory experience. I think that those of you who know us know that our work is designed for sensory experience. We're very deliberate about designing for the senses. And what we mean by the senses are the five senses. But in addition to that, we're very focused on memory as a sense, as a perception, as a way of perceiving and experiencing something. So you will see from these images of past projects of ours how we detail things very much for tactility and the sight of it, the taste, the smell, the recall, the way that you experience it with your whole body, the flooring with the textures so that you feel it with the bottom of your feet. And we're very mindful that we want you to experience with your whole body and your whole being and see and touch and feel all of it and be aware of the temperature in the room by touching the marble ballast, the handrail and, you know, just really feeling where you are and experiencing things with your whole body and collectively as a group of people with your whole group, your whole family or your whole team. So we, I always uh, want to reinforce that the sensory experience is at the core of how we design, okay? It's to really make you aware of your surroundings. We feel that by engaging your entire body, you're more conscious. So what we try to do is design spaces that are very outward-oriented or very aware of their environment and their context and create moments in which you connect with it and consciously and deliberately select you know, trees and plants and finishes and orientations so that we can achieve those glistening, dappled, sparkling, dripping moments. And those are all of the other senses that we want to bring about, the sense of awe and wonder and, you know, the, give you the chills and just give you all these and bring about the whole sensory experience, not about just using your eyes and your ears and your touch and so forth, but really about experiencing in the broadest sense. So here you see, for instance, the different colors of stones and the dappled sunlight and the way the shadows fall on the materials, which are deliberately chosen. So when we design 
architecture, we hope, and most often we do the interiors and we do the landscape at the same time, so that we can actually design the total experience from beginning to end. It's, it's not, you know, common that you get to do this, but yet as we've gone forth in our career, we've had the opportunity more often, most of our clients prefer us to do architecture, landscape, and interiors together because they are looking for an experience. They want us to explain to them what, are, what we're going to create and they want us to deliver it. And it's very difficult to do that when you have three different teams of people with three different agendas coming along to achieve their own goal. Okay? For us, we're invested in learning about their culture. We really want to understand their place and we want to understand how they process, how they experience and how they interact. How, what is their attitude toward nature? Because in every place we go to, people have a different way of experiencing nature. For some, it's you know, very, very big and bold and open, and for others, it's very subtle and discreet. And you know, there's no single way. So we use the word rooted in culture, memory, and place, and I'm glad this talk came about to enable me to really elaborate a little bit on what it means to be rooted. Rooted to me means from where you draw what nourishes you. So a tree is rooted in soil, and that soil is what feeds the minerals and the water that the tree needs to grow. And we are rooted in our own communities, we're rooted in our values, we're rooted in our jobs, in our offices, in our friendships, and in our families. And that's what nourishes us. So I think it's very important that architecture and design be rooted in something. Okay? For us, there are three things. There's culture, memory, and place. And it's a bit of a meditative process to make sure that at all moments, as we design, we are drawing as much from the soil around us, from that culture. Are we listening? Are we telling them our culture? Are we imposing our values on them? Or are we listening to the way they work? We really try to listen to them. We're not interested in exporting our culture and telling people to do things the way we do it. We don't even think we've figured out how to do it ourselves. We want to understand how they do it. And when you work in as many cultures and as many countries as we do, you find that people have amazing ways of doing things. Families, arranged marriages, running businesses, working together with friends, things that are unimaginable in our world. And yet they've done it for centuries and they've done it successfully. So I think that it's important to understand people's culture, not by just taking their instructions, but by listening to how they give the instructions. You know, really drawing from them what they want. I always tell my young staff, try and find five things that, they are, that are important to your client and make sure you deliver all five. Five each time you have the opportunity to do something for that client. Just five. If you could just remember five things that client wants, doing what the client wants is really the key to delivering a successful project. So, in these images, I'm showing you what I call culture, the culture of the families, the way of life, how they interact with nature, how their indoor-outdoor tolerance is expressed, whether they leave the windows open, how they build, the culture of construction, how they interpret, how they use materials. In this case, in the Maldives, they value the boats. These beautiful boats have been upcycled and they've been used to build furniture, you know, with their paint, with their surface, with their rough and tattered edges. And in this instance, we've taken the coral that washes up on the beach in the Maldives to do an exhibition to build awareness of the vulnerability of our surroundings and how coral is in danger. Um, so you see that in this case is a case of a family who had a piece of land in Singapore which is so scarce that when I spoke to them and I said, you realize how scarce and how rare it is to have a piece of land in Singapore with trees and a garden. You're so fortunate. Why don't you build the smallest house you can possibly build and build the biggest garden you can, and you'll be the only guy in Singapore who lives in a little house in a big garden. And my client said, sure. You know, he felt very proud of that piece of land, and that land was adjacent to other empty land as well. So it looks like a giant, giant, endless green you know, garden, but it's actually not. It's only like 20, 16,000 square feet. It's not that big. But what we did was we let the birds drop seeds. The trees that grew there were the trees that came naturally from the birds that did the selection. And that garden grew so fast and so organically that it took over the whole house. In this house in Bangalore, I think this dining room really best expresses how this family lives. How many of us sit in a dining room like this every day with our, with our loved ones? They really do. They interact. They sit 10, 12, 15 people together and they eat a meal together. And they can leave the windows open on both sides to have these two wonderful courtyards and experience the weather. 
almost throughout the year because Bangalore is just such a beautiful city, garden, gorgeous green city. So these are things that we have to go there and we have to learn and we have to listen and we have to investigate. Um, this is a family from the Middle East, from, from Dubai, who came to Singapore and wanted to build a home, and they wanted to live their lifestyle in Singapore. So you will find that there are many details in here that really express that Middle Eastern lifestyle, which is extremely different from the way a Singapore family would live in Singapore. They had screens, they had divided spaces, they had areas for the men and areas for the ladies. They had different approach to being in the outdoors. They wanted it shielded and protected from the sun, assuming it was going to be very hot, not knowing that we want to actually have as much ventilation as possible. So we had to encourage the ventilation while shielding from the sun. And they appreciated craftsmanship. They wanted the best quality of stone and the best quality of everything. So really, it was a place that could express their own culture. Um, memory, it's no secret, is my favorite. I think it's the most wonderful gift that we each have to differentiate us, because no matter how identical our experience is, our memory causes us to sense it and remember it in a totally different way. So we can never have the same experience as anybody else. To us, designing for memory means designing to create memories. It's not about nostalgia. We're not trying to create things that make you remember other things. Your grandmother's living room and so on and so forth, and the good old days and all that. We're not about nostalgia. We're trying to create things that will cause you to create and encode new memories so that later you will recall the memory, not the place necessarily, but how you felt when you were there. Okay? So, for instance, you see the copper pots or the, the music system that you saw just earlier on that was one of the best music systems I had ever experienced. And it was really unforgettable to sit there and look at the sound system with your eyes. Of course, hearing it was amazing, but to see it function and to see these copper pots and know that the chefs in the restaurant are using them. And this little soap dish, which is a detail of you know, how you wash your hands in a concrete house. And this house that had this red beacon in the sea. The beacon was a navigator's beacon that got the ships to know how they were coming into Singapore. And the family chose this plot right in front of the red beacon. And at first, they wanted to get rid of it. They wanted to apply to the, you know, the office of the government and say, can you take away that thing? It's blocking our ocean view. And I said, but that thing is the most important marker. It's told sailors and navigators for centuries how to find their way back home. And then they embraced it, and now they refer to their house as the beacon house with the red beacon in front. So finding that little piece of its culture and kind of loving it or being attached to it, celebrating it, making it a memorable thing is what we try to do. And I think that it's by doing that that we actually can give our modern design an identity. because. Modernism has suffered from the outset, from the, this you know, idea that it is displaced, that it can be reproduced in any place, and that it could be anywhere. As we saw with the previous lecture, there was a lot of concern with the generic, with the similar, with the sameness. But by rooting it in memory and by rooting it in place, we can actually use our own faculties, our own sensibilities to retain and to give meaning to it in such a way that you remember it in a way it could only be there. It couldn't possibly have been anywhere else. This is modernism rooted in a very particular way. And there are little things, you know, as humans, the shadows of the trees in certain seasons are something that we can recall if we live with it every day of our life, and we can grow very attached to it. The sunlight on the staircase or the glistening and this different... We underestimate how attached we can be to the plants and to the trees and to the light and to the wind that we depend on when we live with it. Somehow we were taught away from it. Maybe it was the sameness in the visual education that we received. But this kind of images that I'm showing you now, which are literally the views from the kitchen sink in the window, we try to design them for the rituals of daily life. Okay? We specifically aim that when you're in the shower, at the sink, walking down the stairs, washing the dishes, doing laundry, leaving the house, coming to the house, those things that are your daily rituals and you do over and over again, we try to always trick you into being aware of nature. Instead of looking in the mirror and brushing your teeth and staring at yourself, you're looking out at the garden every time you brush your teeth. And before you know it, brushing your teeth becomes an opportunity to engage your surroundings. Right? So we put the garden, we put you know, all these wonderful things. So we try to engage the senses also, because when you experience nature with all of your senses, you experience it much more deeply and you're more likely to remember it. So 
We designed the spaces deliberately to relate to their surroundings. And you can see here the choice of colors, for example. And we make design solutions that make us very aware of the vulnerability of our surroundings. So in this case, we put a restaurant right on the beach. This is that house in Singapore where we let the trees take over and the house became small. It's not a small house, but it became small relative to the garden around it. And sometimes we do actually draw inspiration from nature and we reproduce things like here you had the idea of the tree, the banyan tree coming down with its roots. And this is one of our favorite images. It's a hotel in Bangalore where the Europeans come in the winter and they quickly throw on their bathing suits and they go on their roof and they lie down and they get a suntan, which is shocking because in India you just see all these white people laying on the rooftop in the middle of what is winter in Germany doesn't really make sense until you realize what they're leaving and what they found in the beautiful warmth of the Bangalore January or February. But these are images that I'm showing you now that are meant, they're places that when you experience them, they're guaranteed to remain in your memory. You just can't forget walking out in the middle of the ocean to a spa treatment room where you actually get your massage, the sun sets around you and then you walk back in the dark. You don't, you don't easily forget it. Now I'm going to talk to you about three specific projects, and I would like to talk a lot less so that you don't pay attention to me and you yourself try and experience it a little bit. So I'll just say as little as possible for the remainder of my presentation. Um, yeah, clock's ticking. I see that. This is a home in Singapore. It's quite explained. You'll see. You'll see how time, in this slide you're gonna see, we took the photos one year apart. So that was when it was brand new, and this was one year later. Look how the landscape grows in Singapore. It's insane, right? You can completely envelop a house in landscaping. And from this plan, you can see that this is a landscape plan. We were actually selecting the materials of the building. We used one material, which is Chinese granite, for every surface, floor surface throughout the entire building. So that whether it was a swimming pool, a bathroom, an entrance hall, a driveway, a living room, it's all the same material, but all of them have different textures and different finishes. So you see this consistency of the material, but it always, you know, you feel it differently underfoot. And we also, you know, designed this house to have different landscapes at every level. And here's, this is the entrance hall with a light that comes in from the side. It's a west-facing screen, so every afternoon, the sun glows onto these little glass beads, and you have this warm afternoon light welcoming you home. This is the same west facing where the tree casts the shadow on the little pool deck. And it's a place for solitude, but it's a place to just be aware of the end of the day and enjoy that moment of sunset. So, as you can see, it, it's really about how you feel. Whether you feel comfortable, whether you feel good, I'm not sure. What's important to us is that you fully and deeply and completely feel it and engage in it so that as you become aware of what's happening with nature around you and those transformations that occur, you feel a part of it. You feel rooted, you feel you belong there, and you feel that that is your identity. So that's exactly why I was very glad that this identity theme came up, because I think ultimately belonging is what we all long for, is to belong, to be long, yeah. And we belong when we know our place, right? When we know the people, the surroundings, it need not only be, you know, the office colleagues and the people of our own nationality and all that. It could literally be a tree, it could be a season, it could be the wind, it could be an unexpected swell in the sea that we feel that we have a connection with, if not a relationship with. So this is basically the goal of our work. And in each project is a little bit different you'll find that the houses are very, very different. This, this house is for a completely different culture, obviously, of the family's lifestyle than the next one that you're gonna see, and the one after that.
So here's the example of the place where you brush your teeth and you don't have to look at yourself brushing your teeth, which I think is a privilege. Every day, butterflies or bees or different birds are nesting in the shrubs, and you can actually focus on what's beyond you and your own face and the rest of the world out there. These are some furnishings that were designed for that house. Um, it's called the Chilton Collection, and you can see the bedside tables and the dressing rooms. They were inspired by a Chinese Ming Dynasty cabinet that you see in this photo in brown, right in the center. And after studying that cabinet, it inspired this set of tables which has a similar geometric proportion and little details which were inspired by that, sort of in the memory of it. So you have all these different versions of it, which are now manufactured in Spain. Um, and this is a little bit just to show you about how the landscape experience was different on every floor. So you had the ground floor, the second floor, which is screened in, and then, of course, the attic, which has a pond on the roof. So you have different landscapes. Even within a small urban house, you have different landscape experiences, like the morning sun on those vines casting leaf patterns on the staircase. And then I always show this little bit about the construction, because there's a memory element to it. When we build a building, I mean, we all know that when you pour concrete, a lot of work goes into that formwork, into preparing and weaving. And I call it almost like doing crochet, tying each of those little metal knots together with a wire. To, sh to do the formwork, and then you build the formwork around it into which you're going to cast. But that wood actually remains, the texture of that wood remains on the concrete of the building permanently, and it's permanently cast in. And in this case, it was a beautiful red, red wood that did it. This project, I'm going to show you very briefly, it's our first project in London, completed about a year and a half ago. We called it the design of diplomacy because it was for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Singapore. They wanted to build the Singapore High Commissioner home in a listed property in St. John's Wood. Beautiful, beautiful, semi-detached. One of the very first semi-detached buildings in London that was hundreds of years old and perfectly restored. We were doing the interiors. What we wanted to do here was to take an element of Singapore culture, which I see as a gift from the English, in the time when the when Singapore was a colony of, the U of England, there was an appreciation of gardens. The whole idea of the garden city is a gift which I believe England gave to Singapore. And unlike many other cities in Asia, we deeply appreciate our landscape. We care for it and nurture it, and we realize that it's what sets us apart as a city-state, is that it's this beautiful garden city. And in this case, what I chose to use for what I'm going to show you shortly has to do with a rug design. The rugs were inspired by Singapore paintings from the Nanyang style of art. The Nanyang style was led by Liu Kang and a group of artists who studied in Europe, learned about European art, were very inspired by Paul Gauguin in you know, early 20s and 30s. And they came back to Singapore and began their own t painting style, which was inspired by European art. And these three paintings that you see here, the upper one is called the Durian Cellars, the one on the bottom was the Herons, and the third one is Listening to the Birds. I'm going to focus on this one for the rest of the presentation and tell you how it inspired the rug design of this High Commissioner's residence. If you look at the canal in the background, there's a bright blue, glistening texture, which gives a sense of place to where these Durian Cellars were. They were along the Singapore River, preparing their wares for the morning market. They were smelling the durians, they were checking the fruit to see if it was ripe and ready to sell. And you can see that the guy in the front has a, a pile of mangosteens, and the ones on the right are smelling the durians, and the one on the left is checking the durians. So these men are checking their goods, and they're understanding what they're going to sell so that they can sell the best durians in the best state. Well, the water pattern inspired us. We thought it was very important to root this carpet's design in its carpet texture. And then we took the fruits, the durians and the mangosteens, we took a slice of the painting and we stretched it, stretched it and abstracted it into something that ended up looking like an ikat woven fabric pattern, but that captured the colors of all of the fruits, captured the water, captured the men's skin tones, captured everything about the surroundings in this one little slice. So we used that abstract image, which we then combined with the water, with a water pattern. And when we overlaid the water pattern on the ikat texture, we got this glistening mangosteen durian and, mango and durian cellar skin tone. 
built into the pattern. And it was very effective. It took months, actually, to develop this. I'm going into a very small detail of something that took a very, very long time to develop. But you can see that we literally took the different fruits and extracted all the different colors to choose the yarns for the carpets. And we... Oops, did I lose one? Yes, we had to choose the individual yarns. We had 45 different colors of wool and silk to work into this hand-tufted carpet, which was made in China over a period of about three months, hand-woven. And eventually, you can see these samples that were sent to me for approval in Singapore, which were, of course, tested by my feet, because I had to use my feet to see whether the carpet's texture was effective. And the, the raised silk against the lowered wool was actually very, very effective. And as we furnished the place, of course, these things happen very fast. They furnished the house in a day, okay? All, all over the course of a day, it, you know, went into that. And you can see in the middle room, you can see the carpet, and here it starts to emerge how it turned out. So I think it's a very good example of how we design for the senses and how the memory influences it and how we're trying to integrate culture and how we end up with this element that was a very important talking point in the reception hall of the High Commissioner's home, where the High Commissioner herself could be proud to say, this is a reinterpretation of our first artists, our first modern artists in Singapore, and talk about their work. So the final project that I'm going to talk about is very close to our hearts. It's the a project in the Maldives that's a St. Regis Hotel. So it's a luxury hotel in a beautiful island called Vomoli. And what you see here are the images of the things that we saw that inspired us about the place, and which the visitors themselves see. And we wanted to make sure that when visitors come, they can see whatever the place has to offer as its culture, as its nature. And those things inspired certain forms, they inspired our reaction, but most importantly, they inspired us to want to share that sense of awareness with the vulnerability of the Maldives and the beauty of the natural setting with our guests. So we developed the architecture and the whole design around the idea of the four ecologies of this particular island, the coastal, the lagoon, the beach, and the jungle. And at the heart of it, sits this building called the Nature Discovery Center. So instead of a hotel lobby, or instead of any hotel buildings, we have this building where you go to on rainy days, and you can have a children's playroom, you can go to an acupuncturist, you can have your hair done, or you can go to a culinary school, or take a Pilates class, or do yoga, or just sit and read a book in a library. The whole thing is a library in the center, and all these different rooms are around it. So there are a lot of rainy days in the Maldives. We never expect that when we go, because we see the beautiful photographs, and we think it's always perfect. But in fact, it rains a lot there. But when you go and you discover that you have the time to sit with your family in this place and read books together and play games together and cook together, they're all the things that you never have time for at home. So we refer to it as the luxury of time. The ultimate luxury is time together with those you love. And we were trying to create as many touch points, as many opportunities, and as many places for people to be interacting with their loved ones. So that's why the center of it is the Vomoli House. It's called Vomoli House Nature Discovery Center. But the whale bar is west-facing, and it's where you have to go at 6.30 in the evening to have a cocktail, because your body will automatically force you to go there to see that sunset. You will be driven. And this is facing due east. So at dawn, you really want to be at the spa where you can sit and have a, get into the blue hole and swim over the sea and have a massage at sunrise. And it just becomes a very natural rhythm that you do sunrise at the spa and sunset at the bar, and the resort kind of tells you what to do. You don't have to think too much about it. This tiny little thing, as we call it, it's like a little treasure chest that was tossed on the beach, is actually meant to be the reception lobby. It's an arrival place, it's a welcome spot, but actually you don't really need it, because when you arrive, you're taken straight to your villa. It's just really a place you can stop and ask questions and get help and get direction or guidance for anything you need. Um, the all-day dining, of course, this being a St. Regis, the culture of St. Regis only came into play after the design of the building was complete. So we had one culture, which was the culture of Vomoli, which we were very attached to, and there was the culture of the owner and their families and what they wanted to achieve. And then came St. Regis, with their very big and boisterous culture, telling us exactly what it needed to be. So you can see that it went from being very organic, but then it had to up the element of elegance. It had to have the luxury feature. You have incredible dining you know, opportunities on this island. 
set in a way that just makes you, again, more aware of your surroundings. So you saw the previous restaurant, which is the all-day dining where you eat breakfast. This is where you can have lunch or dinner, right on the beach. You can just walk across the beach and go there. And it's a very casual, very relaxed, pan-Asian dining setting, and it's completely different from the other, very casual. And then, of course, there's Crust, which is everybody's favorite place to go and get a pizza, which is inspired by a primitive hut made in completely recycled materials. And very simply, it offers great pizza, and that's it, which is what you really want when you're at the beach. So now I'm going to go very quickly through the jungle villas, because we're running out of time. I mean, through all of the villas. So I'm going to just skip a few photos and show you a few. So these are the, this is from the coastal villas. And the villas are different. Each of them have their own furniture that we designed. This is called the Manta series. It was inspired by a manta ray, and you can see that fin sort of flipping up. And the mantas inspired the lagoon villas as well. I'm not sure if you can see the references to the manta rays, but there was kind of these elements of the manta that come out, and they very indirectly you know, influence what is otherwise an unabashedly modern architecture. And we wanted to create spaces, of course, outdoors, where you can lie on these beautiful um, woven nets right over the water and, have a, and watch you know, all the activity in the lagoon and see what's happening and have a sort of a sense of some communal spirit, although you can't see from one unit to the other. And of course, the materials on the inside were very much chosen from the sea. There were the various elements of corals and the blue tones. And these are some of the chairs that were the furnishings that were developed for that space in their showroom space now in Milan. So here you have an element of a small table inspired by that blob of blue glass, which itself is referenced to the sea color. And if you've never been to the Maldives, there is a shade of blue that you see there that is intoxicating, and you want to remember it. You want to see it as much as you can, and you want it to stay in your memory always. So that's why that piece of glass was just kind of like a piece of that blueness frozen that you can see any time. So these are the coastal villas, and they have mother of pearl on the bedside, so as the day, over the course of the day, you see the different colors of the sea reflected in the bedside panels. And that is the John Jacob Astor Villa, the biggest presidential villa in the Maldives. Ugh. Even we were shocked to do it. It's a, a three-bedroom residence for six to 12, with its own staff of six full-time, and it is really an incredible place. It even has a beach. I'm not sure if you saw that, but we literally built a beach at sea over the water in front of this villa. It's pretty extraordinary. And these are some of the furnishings that were designed for the villa. Okay. So, finally, three seconds. I'm going to take half a minute just to tell you what we're doing now, because we haven't submitted any projects to WAF for a little while. We've been embedded in a secret project we're not allowed to talk about. But suffice it to say that it brings us back to doing what we do best, which is exploring sites visiting places, getting to know culture, and experiencing things anew. So we're on a new site. This particular one is in Ubud, in Bali, and we need to really get to know it before we're ready to design for it. So we've spent over a year traveling there frequently as we develop this master plan. And this just, just shows you a little bit. Just see. Yeah, you can see that. It's a drone view of the site with the rice paddies, and it's an exquisite site. And our goal with many of our projects now is to build projects that you actually can't see and that are completely embedded in their landscape. And they have so little impact visually and so little impact on their community so as to be embedded. So this is very, very early master planning stage, a lot more to do. So we're not able to like, render the trees that cover the buildings. So the buildings show quite uh, prominently, but they won't at the end of the day. It's all meant to be completely concealed. But it's an exquisite opportunity to really start again and visit sites and try to sense it and experience it and design for it. Okay. Yes, so that's all. I'll just leave that running. Yeah. Thank you, Maria. Am I on time? Okay. Well, um, well, I've been to Singapore two or three times mm -hmm. and it is a remarkable place. It's incredibly hot, uh, steamily hot, yes. tropical, mm -hmm. uh, 
and I do agree it's a garden city. There is the sense that plants will literally grow anywhere they can, mm -hmm. which kind of offsets the intense urban environment of huge towers yep. with relatively narrow streets between them, at least in the downtown part. Mm -hmm. um, the, chop the shop houses are a, a bit of relief from that and they sort of recall the colonial era of mm -hmm. a little plots and they're kind of quirkier and they've become more, ex they're, they're, you're allowed to be eccentric with a restaurant in a sh shop house, mm -hmm. but not in the downtown area. What I want to ask you about really is the sense of density and proximity about Singapore yep. and you living and working in Singapore, does it ever seem claustrophobic? Um, you know, and I think we humans adapt. We are incredibly adaptable. So it depends on what, where we live and how we get used to it and whether we're happy there and we're at ease and safe, no matter what the circumstance. I mean, I've lived in Japan where it was far more dense and even more claustrophobic in Tokyo. But it's a tiny, you know, it's a country that's so you get cabin the size fever. of Amsterdam. I say you, <laughs> you get cabin fever. And 30 years ago, when I moved to Singapore, I used to ask my students, how many of you have been, you know, where have you been? And a couple of them would say, I've been to, you know, Malaysia or Dasaru or somewhere nearby. Today, if I ask my students, they've been to far more countries than I've been to Latvia and Iceland, and they go everywhere. So it's a kind of airport lounge, really. You're in and out of there. You travel a lot. You leave the country a lot, as much as you can afford to do. And young people, you know, you can get a flight on a budget airline for $65. You can go to Bangkok for the weekend. So we have all these budget airlines. You, you can get out very easily. But going back to the yeah. gardenness and the way things grow, um, you showed us uh, a couple of houses, or maybe was it one house? Or I showed you a house in Singapore. Yeah, one. One. Yeah. And it's clear in the design of the house that there's a hankering to explore the growing. Uh, and to, for every space in the house, somehow to be able to reach out and draw that greenery into the internal spaces. But the truth is that for a lot of the time, you can't live in the garden because it's too hot. It's, it's not too... too hot. It is not too hot for us. My children don't even turn on air conditioning. They were born there. If you're used to it, I mean, I'm amazed oh, yeah. when I go into the kitchen and I see the cook in our kitchen, she never perspires. I mean. When you're used to it, you adapt. It is not, we don't think it's hot. You don't? Most of the time. Most, I mean, some of us like air conditioning and get used to it. But I think if you didn't have the air conditioning on in your primary school, you would not, ex you could adapt. You can live with it. Of course you can go outside. It's you lovely, can. yes. You don't so sit in the sun and sunbathe. A, I mean, it, we don't sunbathe. But, but, but to take the same theme a little bit further, yeah. it seems to me that when you're working in much bigger landscapes, that your mind goes free. Yeah. And if it's a show, you know, if it's a sandbank, then you take the sand. That's something you couldn't do in Singapore because you're in restricted to little plots, yeah. little kind of teeny plots. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you're out there in the ocean, something else happens because the, the sandbank seems to suggest uh, the form of the building and uh, you're exploring the relationship between the sea and the land and the forms of the building seem to be much freer and less modernist. Yes. Have I got it wrong? Um, I think there's a you have a point. I mean, the atoll definitely has a lot of visual elements in it that are inspiring and you don't have to follow forms that you do in urban environments because you don't have the building regulations that are hemming you in and saying you have to be within the limit. But the building the regulations aren't making things square necessarily, are they? They are. Oh. If you saw oh. Natalie's oh. talk earlier, she said, and coincidentally, every one of the buildings was done within that gray envelope because clients want to maximize the space in their building. So if everybody maximizes to the limits of the envelope, you start to get very envelope-shaped buildings. 
And that, that idea of the roof that goes up and then comes down, you see it all over the place. So in Singapore, we, are, we have the Urban Redevelopment Authority, which sets the master plan guidelines and controls exactly what we do. When we go to the Maldives, nobody tells us about the form of the building, so you're right. We're completely unconstrained in Ubud and in the Maldives. Nobody tells us anything as long as it's safe. It meets fire safety standards. It can be any length, height, size that we think it should be. And that sort of seemed to roll over into the project in Bali, yeah. where, where the, the, the constructions follow the, the contours, contours yeah. of, the, of the jungle. Yeah. Um, anyway, it's just a thought that maybe you're, uh, I'm, I'm wondering uh, how to reconcile these two design languages. You think we might the be? The modernist okay. one yeah. and the organic one. Okay. Well, um, I think the organic one is still modernist. I mean, I must say, I think that it's all modern architecture in a way it's conceived and it's understanding of tectonics and structure and detail and assembly and construction. It's really all quite modern, but the forms might be a little bit more unrestrained. They but might also, be. you know, um, from my own experience of the sea, which is mostly confined to the Mediterranean, uh, places in the Med don't stay that pristine as yours. They get kind of, they fall apart. The sea has a corrosive effect mm -hmm. on surfaces. Oh, yeah. And does that, because we couldn't it, see that. Oh, you can. There. You saw how silver, that big whale bar, when we first built it, it was brown. It was beautiful ironwood, and it was rich, deep, dark brown. And we chose that wood because it's so hard that we knew that with the wind and the rain and the sun constantly battering, and they do it fast in the Maldives, within a year and a half, it was a silver tone. It was completely And it, was that something you wanted? We did deliberately want that. We wanted that silver because once it silvers, it's like, the, like, the, like fish scales. Every little piece of that shingle can have a different reflectivity. So you get a very fish-like shingle fish scale experience. So as the sun goes down, it can turn yellow, it can reflect blue, it can change, because it's silver. That's true. Any, uh, but all, well, I mean, many of the projects are for, and they're paradisiac to a European. They look dreamlike yeah. and uh, uh, slightly unreal. <laughs> How do you actually make them feel? You, you, know, you talked about people's feelings yeah. and wanting to put them at ease. So I actually believe that we underestimate people's potential to feel tremendously. We are trained from young to read and to look and to be very visually focused. But what I'm trying to, exactly what the purpose of our design is, to liberate people to feel with their entire body. I talk about the bottom of the feet because I actually think the soles of our feet are incredibly powerful tools for experiencing the world. Whether you feel a Which is what people want path. from a holiday, of course. If well, they... why, why only on a holiday? Why can't you <laughs> in, have a garden in your office? We're in on a holiday, really, yeah. aren't we? But I mean, why shouldn't we feel like, like, for me, often people will look at it and say, well, those are nice, they're luxury homes, they're obviously expensive, and of course you can afford to put landscape in them. But our real goal is to challenge Singapore's 85% of the population lives in public housing, and I think you're going to see Kampong Admiralty later today by Woha, which is not a small site. It is a huge project. Not everything in Singapore is a small project. Most work in Singapore is government work, and it's huge. Most people live in blocks with... A, yes. With the a, ones living on the small plots are the small minority of those who live in private housing. But the vast majority of people in Singapore live in public housing blocks. And our agenda now, and I think you're going to see it with what WOHA is doing, is to really challenge to green that life. Why can't everybody experience nature in the rituals of daily so life? So they could. You could imagine being yes. able to optimize. As you say, plants grow house. everywhere. You just need to put a little bit of soil somewhere and plant it, and it will just go wild and do the work. You don't have to irrigate it. It's, I wouldn't say it has zero maintenance requirements, but it's very low maintenance. And we don't have four seasons, so it remains green throughout the year. And just one final question, uh, which is not really fair, but do you think that, p that the Singapore government is actually wants people to feel their own identity, or do they, oh, are they wanted they to They have perform? to. They want them to feel a strong sense of identity in Singapore because 
It's a small and very vulnerable country, and they fear that if people don't feel strongly bounded to that place and they leave, Singapore will have nothing. So they really feel it's very important that they feel a strong sense of connection of, to place. They have campaigns. You can imagine the campaigns around our National Day to, I belong here, you're at home here, this is where you belong. The rhetoric and the language of belonging is huge. It may well, be why... they're told they should feel as though they belong. They should feel that they're told, yeah. You must, you belong here. You belong here. This is who you are. Yeah. Well, of course, Singapore is a very successful country, so uh, Britain may be heading your way. <laughs> well, I mean, we all have our challenges, but we started a long time ago trying to live in harmony with multicultural, right? We, our country was so small and so vulnerable that we wouldn't have survived. And it really we does live feel together. Like the crossroads of Asia. You see Australians and Chinese and Indians, and it really is a landing yeah. strip. A and, and lots of Englishmen. Thank you so much, <laughs> you. Maria, yes. for introducing us to you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much.